Um, so, molecular clock estimates place the origin of the animals at somewhere between seven and 800 million years ago. But the first uncontroversial animal body fossil assemblages don't appear until the base of the Cambrian when they're already remarkably diverse. And it's been almost since their discovery that fossils of the Ediacara macrobiota have been invoked as representing antecedents to these modern animal clades. But their more enigmatic morphology has also meant that they've been subject to a number of different interpretations of both metazoan and non-metazoan origin. Um, and it's actually the Rangiomorphs, these front, this frondose clade, which has been um, subject to the most disparate of these suggestions. So the Rangiomorphs are an extinct group of frondose, sessile, benthic macroorganisms that appear to dominate the early late Ediacaran assemblages and are characterised by the shared possession of a Rangiomorph unit or element. This is a, a unit of branching architecture where you have branches within branches within branches. Um, nicely illustrated in, from Narbonne et al. 2009. Um, the most famous Rangiomorph, I think, is Charnia masoni. It's a cosmopolitan taxon known from um, across England, Russia, um, Canada, of course, and South Australia. Its known size ranges from around one centimetre to well over 65, with the largest specimens being incomplete. And it is one of the stratigraphically longest ranging genuses of the Ediacaran, making it amenable to both morphological and morphogenetic study. And with the discovery of sites of exceptional preservation, like Mistaken Point here in Newfoundland or North Quarry in the UK, we can begin to analyse populations of these organisms and cover new aspects of both, of both morphology and morphogenesis. So I'll briefly go through what's already known of Charnia's anatomy and then I'll move on to our novel findings. Um, so Charnia is considered to be a unipolar frond with apical and basal polarity. And it has four orders, or four described orders, of this self-similar or fractal branching. So you have primary branches with secondary branches perpendicular to those, tertiary branches perpendicular to those, and quaternary branches perpendicular to those. Um, primary branches lie along a glide plane of symmetry. That's an offset form of bilateral symmetry. Unlike many other unipolar rangiomorphs, Charnia doesn't often preserve, at least in uh, the UK, with a holdfast disc. This is considered preservational, not biological, though. And also, Charnia often doesn't have a stem, as with other unipolar rangiomorphs. Um, however, uh, in study of the Newfoundland specimens, we've uncovered what we're currently calling two new morphotypes. Of course, this may change with uh, further investigation. So on the right, we have the class. This is the holotype of Charnia mason I discovered from the UK. On the left, um, we have a specimen of Charnia from the Bonavista Peninsula. What you'll notice is immediately is the frond is quite skinny, um, and it appears to have this region which looks a bit like a stem, but is something I'll come back to shortly. In the middle, we have another specimen of Charnia uh, from the Bonavista Peninsula. Um, uh, the frond form is kind of in between these two, but it again appears to have this stem-like region or connecting region. So this is part of an area we term the basal extension, which is a downwards extension of basal branches that is varial in both its presence um, and its length with and between populations. So this is an interpretation of the holotype. This is the basal extension here, and it represents this area in the fossil. So the holdfast disk of the holotype is just out of shot in here. In specimens from Newfoundland, it gets slightly more complicated, and you have an array of specimens, some of which really do look like they have a stem, and some of which quite clearly look like they have an area of basal extension. Um, some of these specimens which look like they have a stem, if you look more closely, you can see a faced uh, sides of primary branch units. And so one hypothesis we're currently working with um, is that they do have a basal extension, or do not, as the case may be, um, and they may be sheathed or something, and this is resulting in taphonomic variation that we see um, across the peninsula. Um, so, there have, of course, been two previous models of Charnia and Rangiomorph growth more broadly, the Antcliffe and Brazier model, which invoke um, an apical generative zone up here and use this to rule out an affinity with Penatulaceae and Adarians, which grow from down here. And the Hoyle, Cuthill and Conway Morris model of 2014, uh, which invokes a cell similar or fractal and iterative grot branching morphogenesis um, across the size range. Um, and these provide nice hypotheses which we can evaluate. 
So for our model, we've looked at only specimens from bed B of Charnwood Forest um, to try and reduce error where possible. And we initially wanted to test um, where the generative zone was in Charnia and evaluate Ancliffe and Brazier. And our hypothesis here was that if Charnia did grow from its apex, you would expect to see the absolute size of the most apical primary branches being similar across the size range. Um, what you can see here is that there does appear to be a trend, um, but this is due to the presence of an aberrant specimen, both in terms of the size, the overall size of the specimen and of the primary branches. If we remove this specimen for the time being, uh, we don't really see any trend, which would support Ancliffe and Brazier. Um, the largest specimen we then invoke as perhaps representing a second stage of Charnia growth, where differentiation of new units from an apical growth zone is no longer occurring, or is occurring much more slowly, and it's much more inflation dominated. Um, because we describe this dynamic area of basal extension, we also set out to test whether there was a more basal axial growth zone. And our hypothesis here was that if there was this area of dynamism near the base of the frond, we would expect it to make up a proportionally different amount of the frond. Um, so what you can see here is that although um, some specimens quite clearly don't have any basal extension, so, so this is specimens where we can very clearly see the base of the frond, and this isn't very common in Charnia, sadly. Um, and we can also have, see two specimens here, which are pretty much the same size, but have a very different proportion the basal extension makes up. And so we do consider that there is this area of dynamism near the base of the front. If we quantify the secondary branch elements in this area, which is something I'll come on to, we, um, we find that the... Um, Basal extension is produced by the selective expansion of spatially regulated secondary branch elements. So you don't have a significantly large number of secondary elements in the basal extension. If we look at um, the population, so this is six specimens where we can very clearly see um, the width and the top to bottom of the specimens. Um, and so because we've tried to validate the Ancliffe and Brazier model, the uh, primary branch zero um, is the most basal branch, and these are considered to be the youngest primary branches over here, with specimen length along here. So the size ranges from about two and a half to 45 centimetres, and up here we have the primary branch length um, in millimetres. So, oh, and um, the gaps in data represent branches where we can't make a totally accurate measurement, so rather than extrapolating, we've just omitted it. Um, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Um, and what we can see is that the larger specimens do appear to have uh, both greater number of primary branches, okay, a greater number of primary branches, and they are longer, which is to be expected. <laughs> um, um, if we look at these specimens individually. We can see that from about two and a half to 15 centimetres in length, they appear to show a broadly linear relationship between their position along the apicobasal axis and the size of the primary branch in millimetres here. So branch number is represented one, and then two will be on the, the other side, and branch length is a linear, relationship, a linear measurement sorry, up here. In larger specimens, so from the holotype, which is about 20 centimetres upwards, this linear, or broadly linear relationship seems to break down somewhat and we have these um, areas of non-linear growth. So we start around here near the base of the front and then in the larger specimen this is um, exaggerated further and we have this area near the apex of the front which I have discussed already. So we have, and don't forget this is the outline of the front, so we do have these areas of secondary expansion in the front. Uh, we can look at these specimens together in terms of the maximal number of primary branches and specimen size. Obviously, this is quite a small sample set at the minute. Um, but it does appear to conform to somewhat of a linear relationship, and this intercepts uh, with specimen size at a positive number. And this is perhaps suggestive and supports Kensington, uh, sorry, will be 2011, which suggests that um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the size, there is a non-frond, pre-frond or unmodelled stage in Charnia growth, um, which we tentatively term the pre-frond. It could of course just be that this is a very rapid um, 
uh, increase in the number of primary branches, but this is an area that we don't know anything about at the minute. We next moved on to secondary branches. Oh, uh, this is, yeah. So we're looking at primary branch number across here, the specimen length again, and the maximal, well, the number of secondary branches along here. Any dot that has a circle around it represents a minimum estimate. That's where we couldn't ac accurately count to the very end of the primary branch. And there are two things about this. So first of all, the most apical primary branches do appear to have um, a smaller number of secondary branches. But also the relationship that we were seeing in the primary branches, the increase in size and then the decrease, isn't so apparent. And it appears that secondary branches um, remain more steady across the organism. This is not to say that they do not increase across the size range, or the organisms cannot increase them across the size range, um, as you can see here. But it's suggestive that something is going on with the secondary branches. And so we consider that there may be three stages to Charnia's development, uh, what we're calling a prefront stage, but it's really represented by an unmodeled area where we don't have specimens at present to see what's going on. The differentiating front, which is characterized by primary branch differentiation from an apical or subapical growth zone. And then we move into the inflating front, which is characterized by these areas of spatially and temporally controlled secondary branch expansion, as you can see here. So um, what can this tell us about phylogeny? So we have the maintained differentiation of units across development. This is not how fungi grow, which is a previous hypothesis put forward. Um, this goes along with concurrent axially delineated inflation and a determinate form across all known life stages. And again, this is not how plants or algae, which is a previous hypothesis, grow. We also have the presence of marked ontogenetic shifts, at least one, perhaps two, we're not sure. So in comparison with extant macroscopic organisms, we would resolve Charnia and probably other Rangiomorphs as falling within the total group Metazoa, and as such find it informative on the subject of early animal evolution, and in the future helping us to understand the evolution of development. Thank you for listening. I'd like to thank my co-authors, Mark Puttick, Jack Matthews and Richard Thomas. <laughs>